welcome everyone to uh, everyone attending the session here. Um, we will be listening to Nick uh, from Stony Brook University present on catching transparent fish. And um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please note that you cannot submit them through Zoom, but you can submit them through the Whova app. And you um, can do that just to the right. There's a button there that you can click. Um, click that button, open it up, type your question in, and we'll be happy to take any questions um, toward the end of Nick's, uh, Nick's session here. So thank you very much. And Great. with that, I will turn it over to Nick. Excellent. Thank you for having us. Um, so my name is Nick Nikiforakis. I'm a professor at Stony Brook. And Brian, who's lounging here on the couch and hiding, who will come in shortly, uh, here he is. Hi. Uh, he will present, uh, you know, the the better part uh, the, of the second part of his presentation. So the title is of our talk is "Catching Transparent Fish: Analyzing and Detecting Man in the Middle Fishing Toolkits." Uh, and if you take that title and you type it into your favorite search engine, you should be able to also find an academic paper with all the details. Uh, you know, much more than we'll be able to discuss today. So with that. Um, Let's start talking about uh, stolen data and their value. So um, there are various uh, online websites that have statistics regarding the cost or the value of each piece of stolen data. So you can see here that you start from uh, various credentials to accounts such as PayPal for a uh, dollar and fifty cents, right? Spotify accounts for two seventy five, and then once you actually start uh, stealing um, data that can be used to generate other data such as the user's driver's license. Uh, so a security number, these prices can then keep going up. Uh, and this indicates, of course, that in fishing, you have specialization of labor, labor like you have in the regular markets. So the people who are stealing credentials from users and they are stealing social security numbers, they do not necessarily immediately monetize them themselves. Rather, they can just sell them on to someone else in bulk. And then that someone else can then try to monetize them um, and have return on their investment. So uh, this is the situation that we have in fishing. and. Um, Fishing is actually becoming uh, more and more popular as years go by, rather than less and less popular. So um, you can see here on this graph that uh, we see the pretty much a, a time series of the instances of fishing and malware. Uh, malware is in blue and uh, fishing is in red. You can see their instances from 2007 until about 2020. And you can see effectively that we have a crossover point in around 2017 where fishing starts overtaking malware. So malware sites, sites serving malware, are becoming less and less popular, whereas phishing sites are becoming more and more popular. And there is a specific reason behind this. Um, so we did witness uh, browser vendors um, uh, strengthening their browsers and adding sandbox technologies and capabilities. So it's becoming harder and harder to actually do drive-by downloads in browsers. And once we removed plugins like Flash, uh, uh, more and more capabilities from exploit kits went away. So attackers just switch to, um, to the easiest path, to the path of uh, least resistance. And that just remains for the last two decades, phishing. Uh, and so as you all know, effectively phishing involves the use of social engineering to coerce victims uh, into disclosing private financial information and other sensitive information of interest to an attacker. So these can be logging credentials for private and public services, and then financial records, which could come after the logging credentials, uh, where people can then monetize the credentials that they've stolen, social security numbers, um, get loans in your name potentially, and so on and so forth. And um, like I mentioned earlier, the human element remains the weakest part of the security chain, right? So I don't have, as an attacker, I don't have to try to break out of a browser sandbox and you know, link zero day exploits to try to download code on your machine automatically, if I can just get you to accept three dialogues and then install that same malicious binary voluntarily or provide your credentials under uh, a specific social engineering case scenario. And so um, various companies have actually calculated that the average business, uh, when it's a victim of a phishing attack, um, it incurs a cost of between four and $5 million because of all the um, recovery that they need to do, of all the training, um, the, the, the use of the lost capital. So it is a very um, expensive um, um, problem. 
And it is quite similar in terms of magnitude to, the, to another very important problem, which is of ransomware that we will not be talking too much about in this talk. So uh, we're all familiar with phishing and how it works, but I would like to point out some of its core elements because they are very much relevant to how the tools work that we will analyze in this talk and how we go about detecting them. So the first thing that attackers do is that they have to create copies of the victim sites that they target. And traditionally this would involve either just creating a copy from scratch, right? Or perhaps downloading a copy of the website, let's say using wget and then customizing it manually or using old templates that someone has built or perhaps even purchased templates for how paypal.com looks like paypal for drop templates for dropbox.com and then just setting up the same templates over and over again on different phishing sites trying to uh, lure credentials so these templates then are then need to be obviously hosted on some server and so the attacker then has two uh, possibilities available to him the first one is to hack a web server so use some sort of exploit uh, that allows the attacker to be able to upload content on a benign server and then create a new subdomain on that server or just a new folder in that server, upload the template of the phishing site. And now he has a link that points to something that looks like the login page uh, of, uh, of an important and uh, popular uh, online service. Um, and the alternative to that is to actually go ahead and purchase a server like a virtual machine on a public cloud, which gives the attacker more capabilities. This, the attacker can be root on it, so he can install whatever packages without restrictions, but of course now they're, they're need, the attacker needs to have a credit card with which to, to link to the account. So there is a risk for the attacker where he needs to reveal more private information. And so in traditional phishing, uh, this was less available. So in most statistics that you'll find online regarding regular phishing, you'll find that most of, this, most of the time uh, phishing sites are hosted on compromised servers because the attacker then bypasses the whole need of revealing himself to a, a hosting company. And so once these two elements are in place, then the attacker effectively just needs to be able to blast his link uh, to victims. And this blasting can be either, uh, like I mentioned, blasting. So just reach as many warm bodies as possible, playing the, uh, the probabilistic game. But if I send this link to a thousand people, maybe 10 or five of them will click. And maybe some fraction of these five or 10 will then proceed to enter credentials. So at the end of the day, you know, the more people that I can reach, the, the larger the uh, amount of credentials they can gather, right? Or uh, the variation of, of phishing called spear phishing. I'm not interested in, you know, in anyone's credential. I'm in credentials. I'm interested in one specific person's credentials. And so I will only share that link that I've created with one specific person, right? And so this allows me to customize it very well. And it can also evade a lot of our spam detection and phishing detection systems because a lot of the systems are based on hundreds of thousands of people receiving the same link. So if only one person or a small number of people receives a link, a lot of the systems that we have in place don't actually work. Um, at least they don't work quite as well. So traditional phishing, even though it's a very simple attack to conceptualize, it does come with limitations for the attack, right? So the first one is that implementation errors can lead to detection, right? So maybe the site is broken, the template was not quite what it should be, right? Uh, so the attacker can set up a website that looks broken. It doesn't quite give the look and feel of a professional site that the user is accustomed to. Um, the second one has to do with actually the fact that the changes, the, the web page is being mimicked. They are a moving target, right? Dropbox and PayPal and Bank of America, they can keep changing their web pages every single day if they want to, right? But the attacker creates one phishing copy of the web website and now is just using it. So if the user who clicks on a, on a phishing site, on a link to a phishing site, reaches that phishing site and then observes like an older version of this uh, web application, he may realize that something is wrong, right? And so he may actually stop and not uh, reveal his credentials because he's actually looking at an outdated copy uh, of the phishing website. And finally, uh, the attacker has to deal with all the anti-phishing scanners that security researchers and security companies are operating, where effectively these are scanning emails, these are scanning domain names. So there are many, many ways of building uh, anti-phishing technology. And so the attacker kind of has a, a short horizon of abuse. Uh, within a few hours and definitely within the first day, one of these scanners will have detected this link and will start takedown procedures with a registrar, with a hosting provider. So there are all of these elements that make an attacker's life more complicated. 
um, which of course the attacker doesn't like. And we observed an evolution in the space of uh, phishing tools, which is what today's talk is all about. And so this evolution refers to uh, what we call man in, the, man in the middle phishing toolkits. And so as you can see here on the figure on your screen, we, we stop having this static copy of a site that the attacker has control over, and we switch to an actual malicious reverse proxy. So now when the victim user receives a link and clicks on that link, and he reaches the server controlled by the attacker, that server doesn't actually host anything in and of itself. What it does is it takes the user's request and it relays it, it replays it to the real victim site. And that would be step number two that you see on this slide. And then whatever the victim site responds with, the HTTP response, the attacker server can then rewrite. So for example, he changed domain names to his own domain and then forwards it back to the victim. And so effectively you have this man in the middling going on between the victim client and the victim server and the attacker has positioned himself in the middle. And it's important to understand that the attacker is not trying to break SSL in this process. He's not hoping that you know, he'll use self-signed certificates and the user will click through. The attacker effectively deals with two separate uh, TLS sessions. So on the left, you have one TLS session that the victim established with phishing.com. Everything is encrypted. The attacker has a let's encrypt signed certificate. Uh, excuse me, the victim uh, observes this uh, valid certificate for phishing.com. So he gets the green lock, the green lock icon in his browser's bar. Everything is good. The attacker is able to decrypt that traffic because it is his own key. And then the attacker is actually a client towards the second TLS connection on the right. And he can just replay um, the user's get requests and post requests to the real victim server, right? So at the end of the day, the attacker has access to everything in clear text. And there are no warnings on either side of this communication uh, that would indicate that someone is, you know, man in the middling and is trying to break TLS and anything like that. So credentials are stolen in transit in this way. And what is even more interesting is that uh, all the sites that are using two-factor authentication, where the user will receive an SMS or will open up like an app on their phone and will copy paste the code from that app, this code will also go through the attacker server. And so at the end of this process, uh, the user has logged in for real on the victim site. Uh, he has an authenticated cookie that allows the user to just click through. Everything's working pre-authentication and post-authentication, uh, but the attacker now is in control not only of the user's credentials, but also is in possession of an authenticated cookie. And so now the attacker can use that cookie that is authenticated and has passed the two-factor authentication step to then perform arbitrary um, activities on the server in the name of the user. And so today we have a number of these uh, man-in-the-middle phishing toolkits in the wild. Uh, I believe the most popular one is Evil GeneX, and then you have Moran and Modlishka, which have similar but uh, properties, but they have certain differences. And officially, these are um, tools that are used for um, uh, phishing training, right? And I have no doubt that that's how the developer intended them to be. But these are turnkey software that someone can just download, set it up on a web server, as we will show you, and now he's phishing the world. So there is nothing stopping an attacker from taking the phishing training tool and then just pointing it to real users on the web and then stealing the credentials for popular and less popular services. Um, and so we want to show you a, a demo of these tools in case uh, people haven't heard of them before or haven't quite realized how it is that they work. So let me share uh, a video with you so that we make sure that the demo works. Um, all right, so here you can actually see that uh, we have a split screen. On the left, we see the victim's browser, how it is that the victim would see things. And on the right, you will see um, the, um, the part that the attacker sees on his web server that is under his control. So once we start this, you can actually see here that um, the attacker uh, is setting up Evil GeneX and is running it on his server uh, and is able to actually set it up and say that you know the IP of my malicious server is this, and I wish to serve um, to man in the middle GitHub because I want to steal GitHub credentials and GitHub authenticated cookies. Um, so that is what the attacker is currently doing. He's just pretty much loading up this evil GeneX tool um, and instructing it uh, with the phishing campaign that he's about to start. Uh, and 
everything, as you can see, is quite user friendly because, again, this is a, a real tool that is meant to be used in real settings. But unfortunately, attackers are taking it and abusing it in the wild to fish real people, right? So, as you can see here in our notes, uh, the server will even take will even request Let's Encrypt certificates for you, so that the attacker site will have a perfectly valid uh, TLS certificate. And now we can visit that site, as you can see on the left, from the browser. Uh, and we are actually here getting redirected to youtube.com because we're missing a token uh, in our URL. Uh, and this is effectively built-in evasion technologies uh, in these tools. So that if you just visit the website that is under, under control of the attacker, you will not get the phishing site. You have to visit the exact link that the attacker uh, constructs in order to get access to the phishing content. And that allows those phishing sites to be more long lived than if they would just answer to all, uh, all questions on the, you know, on the root directory of the web server. So now effectively we are clicking on the link that includes that special ID. Um, and you will see on the left, uh, something that should look identical to github.com, right? And it is important here to stress that this is not the template that the attacker downloaded um, and He's serving like a copy of GitHub that was made at some point in time. He's serving the real GitHub as it is right now, as it is passing through uh, the malicious server. And so this phishing site will always look like GitHub.com looks because it's actually serving GitHub.com. It's just rewriting it on the way back and forth between a client and a server. And so now the, the, the user can go ahead and proceed to log in. The attacker ha currently has the credentials, right? You can see them highlighted on the bottom right of the share. And now actually we have a 2FA account, which in the past would stop the phishing attack because the attacker would later try to weaponize his credentials. At that time, a 2FA code will be requested and the victim will be long gone. But in this case, the attack is happening online in real time. So now the user will go ahead and receive a, an email from the real github.com because he's trying to log in, he will copy paste the code located in that email in the phishing site, right? Again, because he's trying to log into GitHub and as far as he knows, everything's working as it should. He's trying to log into GitHub and GitHub is sending him a code. So he has no reason not to post that code uh, in the page that he's asking for it. So, and at this moment, once the user clicks, effectively the user is logged in, everything works as far as the user is concerned, but on the right, on the right hand side of the screen, now the tool that the attacker operates, Evil GeneX, has a fully authenticated session cookie, right? Not only has the user's credentials, but a fully authenticated session cookie that the attacker can now use to perform actions in the user's name until the user logs out, right? And of course, the tools can also disable logout buttons and do other things to increase the lifetime uh, of the session cookies that they have stolen, right? So you can see that these are super powerful tools, right? And they are very much turnkey, very little configuration necessary, uh, and an attacker can just download them, set them up on a web server that he controls, get a domain name, get a free certificate for the domain name, and now he's operational and he's running a state-of-the-art phishing site with evasion capabilities built in, and that will that is far above and beyond the you know what all phishing sites would you know would be able to do with all the limitations that I mentioned to you. So let me switch back to the slides. Um, All right, so, excuse me. So that was a demo. Uh, and now I'll switch over to Brian, who will tell you about the threat model of these new phishing kits and how it is that we can actually turn the tables uh, and detect them online. Brian? All right, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Nick, uh, for giving the background on these toolkits. Um, so as you can see, I, I hope you know you you know, based on that demo and based on everything that Nick said, you can understand the 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 power of these toolkits and the threat that they pose to to just regular users. Uh, so when we're looking to uh, detect these toolkits and and prevent attacks from occurring, we have a very specific threat model that we have to account for um, that we don't have to account for uh, with traditional phishing attacks. So first of all, as you can as you could probably tell, since these toolkits are operating in a man-in-the-middle fashion, the attackers control all application layer content. So this means that if, say, the uh, the online service, say, paypal.com, wanted to 
add in some JavaScript to check if the domain in the URL bar is, is actually paypal.com, well, the attacker can simply just remove this if they know it's there. Uh, same thing with any uh, CSP or X-Frame options or anything along those lines. Also, these toolkits uh, have uh, cloaking capabilities. And you know, again, as they are acting in a man little fashion, uh, they have the ability to uh, prevent access to any phishing content to anyone that's not the intended victim. So due to these things, uh, any sort of detection uh, cannot rely on the integrity of the application layer content. Uh, as I said, we can't just assume that some sort of a JavaScript uh, uh, code that we include in response uh, in responses uh, will be able to, to run uh, because we could simply just be changed or removed entirely. So if we can't fingerprint the content, we decided to look a step lower in the app, in the network stack and actually fingerprint the server uh, because here the content is the real content. It's not uh, different in any sort of way to the real content from the live service, but the actual server itself uh, is different. You know, uh, in a traditional phishing attack, uh, whether the attacker compromises a, a benign web server or they uh, set up their own Apache web server, the actual server is just Apache or Nginx. It's it's not. It doesn't look different to any other Apache or Nginx server. But in this case, this is not a real web server. This is not Apache. This is not Nginx. This is Evil Genx or Morena or Modlishka. Uh, so we could fingerprint the actual server itself. And that's that's what we do here. So as I said, we're, we're looking at the, the network layer. We're looking at net, network level phishing detection. So this reverse proxy architecture that allows these toolkits to launch these highly effective attacks also allows them to be discovered, um, allows us to, to discover the presence of these toolkits uh, in the network communication. Uh, so we look at two different categories of features uh, to detect their presence. First, we look at network timing analysis. So since these toolkits uh, add an extra hop to the network communication between a client and an end web server, we can see discrepancies in the time it takes for packets to be sent and received uh, that doesn't exist when you're communicating directly with the online service. Additionally, as I said, these aren't real web servers. So therefore they look different on a TLS level. So we can use TLS fingerprinting to determine that there's some sort of a discrepancy in the TLS libraries used or uh, other TLS options used uh, that won't be there in a real web server like Apache or Nginx. On top of this, unlike traditional phishing attacks, fingerprinting is possible from both ends of the communication channel. So this means that we can detect the phishing server from the perspective of the uh, victim client uh, by using these, these features that I discussed. Uh, but also, unlike traditional phishing attacks, the actual online service can also detect uh, that there's a phishing attack going on because uh, when the phishing server is talking to the online service, they don't look like a typical web client that's using a browser. So I'll talk more about that towards the end, but for, first we're gonna focus on the client side detection. So first we'll start with uh, the network timing analysis. Uh, so here we have uh, two uh, packet sequence diagrams. So on the left here, we have a direct connection, and on the right, we have a connection through a reverse proxy server. Uh, so we'll start on the left. As you can see, you know, when you're talking to any web server, um, the first thing that happens is a, a TCP handshake. So uh, we have the time it takes for a TCP SYN packet to be sent and a SYN ACK packet to be received, we'll call time T1. Um, and this, this is, uh, talking entirely over HTTP. We're not talking about encryption here. This is just a very basic example. Uh, so we have that uh, uh, round trip time, we'll call T1. In this same scenario, the time it takes to send a HTTP GET request and get back the response, we'll call time T2. Um, and when we're talking over HTTP directly to a web server, time T1 and T2 are roughly the same. Uh, the ratio of those two times will be close to one. However, when we look on the right, 
we can see that we have the same time T1, we have the same TCP uh, SYN packet and SYNAC response that will happen in roughly or exactly the same amount of time as the first example. And this is because the uh, TCP handshake is actually happening with the reverse proxy server here, as opposed to the N web server. However, we could see that time T2 is much larger in this example here uh, with the reverse proxy server. And that's because when we actually send the get request here, the reverse proxy server now needs to do this entire uh, example from the left with the with the end web server, this time as the client, uh, you know, completing the TCP handshake and then getting the actual HTTP response before sending that back here uh, to, the, to the client. So in this example, T2 is much larger than T1. Um, and uh, so we can use this fact that when we're typically talking to say paypal.com, while over HTTPS, it's gonna be slightly different. Uh, if we're talking directly with them, it's gonna look like the example on the left, you know, closer to that. But when we go through this malicious reverse proxy server, it's gonna look more like the example on the right. So what we can do is we can use the ratio of the HTTP request in response, uh, the ratio between that and the TCP handshake to uh, determine discrepancies here. So before we you know, set out to create any sort of uh, tools to detect these toolkits, we wanted to actually test this out. And this is what we did here. So uh, what you could see uh, is the two plots on the left, we have HTTP requests. And the two plots on the right, we have HTTP, or HTTP on the left, HTTPS on the right. And what we're looking at here is a CDF of uh, the ratio between the TCP SYN and SYNAC round trip time and the GET request. Uh, both valid GET requests and malformed GET requests as a way to try to uh, tease out direct responses from the toolkit. Uh, so generally what you could see here is um, we're comparing the, 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 the round trip times of all these, these three toolkits to the known direct, which was just an Apache web server that we set up. Uh, and we, we ran these, these measurements you know, multiple times, which is, is why we have here these distributions. And the important thing to note about these plots is when we look at the known direct, which is this dotted line like up here, um, it's the same on all, all four of, of these plots. If we take any combination of these four plots, we can distinguish each of these three toolkits from the known direct connections. Uh, for example, uh, in this first one over here, we have uh, Moblishka. So we can see obviously that the ratio value of a valid GET request to a TCP SYNAC round trip time will be much larger um, in Moblishka than uh, the, the Apache web server um, and so on for the other, uh, the other two toolkits. So as I mentioned before, on top of the network timing, um, analysis, uh, we could also use TLS fingerprinting. So uh, as I said, man middle phishing toolkits are utilizing unusual TLS stacks if we're talking about uh, typical TLS stacks of web server software that's used by the vast majority of websites online. Uh, so what we wanna look at here uh, is first of all, TLS version supported. Um, so, uh, in this case, you know, a say paypal.com is not going to want to, for, for the safety of their users, they're not going to want to talk to a client that's using, say, you know, TLS 1.0. They would, might want to you know, restrict that to TLS 1.3. So we, but a, a phishing kit is, one of, is going to want to cast a wider net and, you know, not uh, reject a potential victim just because uh, they're using a, a lesser version of TLS. We also want to look at TLS libraries. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, when you look at a, an Apache web server from, uh, from the TLS, from a TLS perspective, it will look uh, very similar to every other Apache web server out there. It will use very similar uh, or exactly the same TLS libraries, uh, you know, typically probably OpenSSL, let's say. Uh, but these toolkits, they're written in Go, so they, at least these three all utilize the Golang TLS library. So what we used uh, to determine the TLS library 
is this tool called TLS Prober, which is an open source tool. And what it does is it sends out TLS client hello packets, uh, a large number of them with varying formats. And it analyzes the format of the TLS server hello responses uh, to determine which library is being used. Uh, so we, uh, it, it returns a set of all possible uh, TLS libraries. There was around 150 of them and the probabilities that each one is being used. So we each, we use these probabilities as features to determine which, uh, you know, if it's a toolkit or not. So with these features in mind, with uh, this methodology, um, sound based on our, our, our pilot test, uh, we had to come up with a ground truth data set in order for us to actually create some sort of a machine learning classifier to detect these toolkits at a network layer. However, since this was the first study on man the middle fishing toolkits, there was no ground truth data set of uh, the behavior of these toolkits uh, in existence. We had to make it our, ourselves. Uh, so what we did is we uh, we set up an infrastructure of 30 globally distributed nodes. Uh, so in this this figure on the bottom right is kind of just a, a, a simple example with just a few nodes. Um, but we set up a, a node in every region of the AWS uh, uh, net, global network. Uh, and what we did is we we set up each node with a uh, a web server, just an Apache web server, a client program to record um, the uh, the network timing uh, of these requests, uh, and each of the three toolkits. And we simply just recorded every permutation of client node to man and little fishing toolkit to web server. Um, and the reason why we had to set up this global uh, network. It's because we wanted to, since we're recording network timing, we wanted to make sure that we can try to remove the natural delay in network packet transmission um, as much as possible. So we wanted to see, you know, if there was an attacker that was located in Europe and you were located in California and the web server you're trying to talk to is actually in Japan, we wanted to make sure that that sort of natural delay that would occur even without the toolkit being there uh, is accounted for. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we had really every sort of geographical distance uh, between these three uh, nodes accounted for. Um, so in total, we recorded uh, just under 150,000 data points um, uh, to feed into our eventual machine learning classifier. So using this data, uh, we trained a random forest classifier uh, with, with this data, as well as data from real world websites. So we recorded the same TLS fingerprinting and network timing analysis um, from Alexa top 1000 sites, as well as uh, sites behind um, uh, load balancing services like Cloudflare. Um, we wanted to make sure that that's sort of an extra hop that occurs from a load balancer uh, that's in use by thousands of websites will not be uh, misattributed to a phishing toolkit. And then also just some sites from our local area, just small business websites that don't use these sort of load balancing services to get a full distribution of different uh, web server setups. And upon training this classifier, we achieved 99.9% uh, .9 accuracy and a five-fold cross-validation score of 99.9. .9. Importantly, what you can see on the bottom here uh, is a figure uh, from an experiment which we, we used to determine if our classifier is robust. So essentially what we did uh, is we ranked our, our, our features, so our feature set from, from most important to least important, from left to right. And we iteratively removed the most important feature, retrained and retested our classifier and recorded the uh, uh, accuracy, false positive and false negative rates. And what this experiment allowed us to do is determine if an attacker knows about our classifier and knows that we have a tool that's searching the web for their websites, can they simply just patch, you know, say the top 10 most important features um, and completely bypass our classifier? So what you could see here is that we have in total just under 200 uh, features. And it's not until we remove, uh, you know, just about 75% of them that we actually start to see a drop off in performance. So this means that our classifier is 
very effectively modeling the entire man the middle fishing toolkit um, architecture and just nature of them in total. So an attacker, if they wanted to actually bypass this classifier, they would have to completely change the, the fundamental um, nature of the toolkit itself, um, which would be very difficult to do uh, since we're really just modeling the reverse proxy uh, nature of the toolkits. So uh, using this classifier, we created a framework, uh, which we call FOCA, uh, which is just a command line tool to uh, you, point a, you point at a, a web host uh, and it records this network level data that we talked about and also a class a classification from our classifier uh, for these phishing websites. Uh, and the name FOCA is, comes from the Latin word for seal, uh, which is, uh, I'm sure as we all know, an aquatic mammal. And uh, before you know, trying to find the name for this tool, I, I, this is something I, I learned, they use vibrations in the water to detect otherwise hidden prey. So it's a, a pretty apt comparison to what we're doing since these toolkits are relatively hidden. Uh, if, if we're just looking at the, the, the application layer because the, the, you know, the visuals of these sites are completely identical to the real site, there's really nothing that you could do to determine that it's a phishing site just by looking at it, but using these uh, uh, side channel features, we're able to detect these, these hidden websites. Okay, so we have another demo showing off uh, the tool. Maybe, yeah, easier if you just do it. Yeah, so uh, here's just a simple example um, of how this tool works. Uh, as far as visuals, um, you know, the, this is a command line tool, so there really isn't much to show as far as the, the inner workings. There's kind of a lot of magic hidden behind the scenes, but this is just to show how fast we could come up with the classification. Um, but as far as the actual analysis, this is all the, the feature set that I talked about already and the classifier that also uh, mentioned. So we can see if we, we try to uh, classify sites like Google or Facebook, uh, we have a label of non-phishing. But if we look at this real phishing site that we found from a um, uh, phishing block list, uh, we could see that we, we do get a, a label of, of phishing. So it's a very basic example here. Um, we'll go back to the slides. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so using this tool, um, this framework, uh, we now wanted to go out onto the internet and determine, are these tools actually being used uh, in the wild? Uh, or are these just toys, uh, like Nick mentioned, uh, for pen testing? Uh, so to do this, we created this uh, phishing website crawling infrastructure, uh, which is broken into four parts here, and I'll, I'll briefly go over each one of these parts. So first we source our candidate domains uh, from certificate transparency logs and phishing block lists. Uh, and the idea here is that we wanted to see, do phishing block lists effectively uh, capture these, these, these websites already or are they relatively hidden? Uh, and conversely, we wanted to see, uh, are there sites, you know, since these toolkits like Evil Gen X will automatically create a certificate for you, they're, uh, inadvertently, they will log their domain onto a certificate transparency log as soon as the site goes online. So we wanted to use these, these certificate transparency logs to capture these sites the second that they go online um, and then compare the results between what we get from the certificate transparency logs to the phishing block list to see is there um, you know, a blind spot in these block lists that, that, these, that these toolkits are occupying. Uh, I guess I'll briefly just mention uh, in a pilot experiment we did, 
we found that that these block lists are in fact uh, not capturing them. Uh, I think in total, after a month of of, of uh, recording uh, and, and analyzing sites from these block lists like Open Fish and Fish Tank, I think we found maybe 17 uh, total uh, websites out of hundreds of thousands of sites analyzed. Uh, so effectively, for the majority of our of our full data collection, we just use certificate transparency logs uh, because there was it was a waste of time to even look at the phishing block lists. Uh, but moving on. So the so once we get our domain, so these come in live from these these URL sources. Uh, we move on to our scheduler module here, uh, which simply just dispatches a worker node um, containing FOCA in the classifier, and also um, a Selenium uh, a browser to just grab an HTML and screenshot of the site, and then stores it in the database. Uh, and the point of the screenshot in the HTML is just for us to be able to verify that the classifier works. Because even though we had very high performance in the lab, we wanted to make sure that you know there's no sites that were just misclassifying, and there would be no way for us to verify. So the idea of the screenshot is that we can take all of our positive classifications, look at the screenshots, and determine does this is this actually a phishing website or not? Next, all of the collected data is fed into the analysis module uh, for further processing, such as content-based clustering of the HTML and the screenshots, um, and other website analysis, uh, you know, such as searching for the IP address of, of the domain on, on block lists or uh, things like that. And lastly, we have a recrawling module. Um, and this module is very important uh, for, for this study uh, for two reasons. Uh, so the point of this is simply just to take a subset of the domains that we crawled already and just revisit them at some later date. So we do this for two reasons. First, uh, as I mentioned, we, we have sites that, use that, we, that we get from certificate transparency. Certificate transparency logs a domain uh, immediately after the certificate is created. Um, so in the case of Evil Gen X, this would work for us because Evil Gen X will create a certificate the second it goes online. So we'll, we'll get a response from Evil Gen X in that case. However, it's also very reasonable that anybody making a website would you know, say create a certificate and then decide, you know, tomorrow I'll put the website up. So if we visit that site the second that it's on certificate transparency, we may not get a response that we're looking for. We'll just get, you know, connection timed out or something like that. Uh, so we want to, for the few days following our first uh, uh, crawling of a site, we want to just visit a few times until we actually get some content back in case you know, this scenario happens. Second, we wanted to uh, revisit all the sites that we got a positive label from FOCA. So if we determine that a site is a man the middle fishing website, we wanted to crawl it for the next, uh, you know, as long as we actually get content from it, to see how long it takes for the site to go down. And I will talk about those statistics that we found from this uh, shortly. So using this infrastructure, uh, we ran a data collection period uh, of exactly one year from 2020 to 2021. In total, we analyzed uh, over 840,000 web pages and discovered over 1,200 man little fishing toolkits online. Uh, and as you can see on the bottom, we have these three plots. So I'll go from, from left to right here. We have uh, first the number of, of toolkits that we discovered per month of our data collection period. And generally what you can see is a, a positive slope in, in the number of sites that we find each month. Uh, so, so this implies that there could be a, a, a greater increase in the usage of these toolkits by, by attackers over time. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm I'm fairly confident that if we extended this out until say March of 2022, we would you know see a, even a greater number of sites every month. Uh, the next two figures are kind of connected. Uh, so you can see we have a, a circle um, in the location, the geographic location of each IP address associated with these toolkits. Uh, and what we what we found is unsurprisingly, uh, these toolkits uh, typically are located on a hosting provider. Um, so unlike a traditional phishing attack, where as Nick mentioned, uh, it, it's common for an attacker to compromise uh, an existing 
uh, website and put their phishing content on it. Uh, since these toolkits are themselves servers that need to listen on say port 80 or 443, they need their own web server. So, so it, commonly attackers are utilizing uh, popular hosting providers like AWS, DigitalOcean, um, Microsoft Azure, uh, et cetera. So quickly, some, some examples of, of the brands that we found targeted. Um, the top three by far are Instagram, Google, and Facebook. Um, and you can see on the, on the right, an example of the domains that we saw uh, for each of these targeted brands. Similarly, we, we analyzed the uh, type of phishing domain uh, that was used to target each of these brands. Um, so we can see that depending on the brand, we have a varying number of, of these different kinds of, of phishing domains. Um, I don't really have the time to go into each one exactly, but uh, you know, we, we could see, for example, the, the, the um, really, I guess the one that sticks out the most is say Yahoo that uses a, almost entirely target embedding domains, which simply just uh, uses the full domain of the targeted site as a subdomain. So say www.yahoo.com.attacker.com. Okay, so as I mentioned, we recrawl each site. So we're able to determine the life cycle of these websites. So starting from the left, we could see that uh, here, uh, we, we show the uh, days relative to our detection that the domain associated with the website was registered. So what we found is that most of these sites use freshly registered domains. So an attacker will set up one of these sites, they'll register a domain for it, and they'll put it right up, as opposed to using old domains uh, that were registered you know, long ago. Next, uh, we could see that uh, we're, here we're looking at the, the time it takes for a website to come online. So this is when we recrawl the sites from certificate transparency. We could see that 93% of them, so here at, at the elbow here, 93% um, come online immediately after the certificate is created, which implies, and uh, you know, the statistics on the usage of these toolkits based on their GitHub repositories would back this up, that Evil Genx is the most popular of these toolkits, and that's why we see 93% go online immediately. Um, Evil Genx is the only of the three tools that creates a certificate for you, um, with the remaining 7%. Uh, being Loblishka and Morena sites. Also, 20% of these toolkits remain online for more than uh, 10 days. Uh, so over, you know, roughly over here, we could see uh, we, we have 80, you know, 80, you know, 5%, let's say, uh, that go offline within um, uh, 10 days, uh, but then we have the remaining 20 that will just stay online for many days following. Uh, either you know, the, the attackers are just never detected or you know, uh, something along those lines. Uh, these sites just are able to remain online and continue to affect users. And the most important finding that we, that we discovered is that only 43.7% of domains and 18.9% of IP addresses associated with these toolkits appeared on a block list at the end of our data collection period. Um, so what this means is that there were sites that we discovered, you know, at the beginning of our data collection period, and an entire year later, those domains and IP addresses were still not on block lists, uh, meaning that they just were able to, if they wanted, to just continue running this phishing site for an entire year without ever being detected. So there is a massive blind spot in the anti-phishing ecosystem that these toolkits are occupying. So once we found these sites online, uh, we wanted to determine what uh, you know, are real users actually being affected by this. You know, these sites can be online and they could just be say uh, pen testers, but we wanted to know our real users of, of you know, say companies uh, being affected by these sites. So we, we partnered with Palo Alto Networks uh, who run um, many firewall devices in enterprise networks. So they have an inline view of traffic from uh, websites online, and then users within these networks. So we gave them the list of all 1,200 or so uh, phishing domains, uh, and they ran them through their databases. 
since they run phishing um, detection services as well uh, using uh, content-based means. And we found that only 56.7% of the domains that we found were labeled as malicious by Palo Alto Networks. And of these, 15.1% received the label at least a week after we discovered them. On top of this, they found that there were over 6,000 customer requests that were directed towards 260 of these phishing websites over a six month period. And these came from uh, 368 distinct firewall devices from uh, various enterprise networks. So as I mentioned earlier, um, on top of the client side fingerprinting that we can do, we could also look at this from the server side um, as from the pers perspective of an online service, say like pay Facebook or PayPal. So similar to, similarly to how we can use TLS fingerprinting from the client side, because these toolkits don't look like real web servers, an online service can look at the requests coming from these toolkits and realize that they don't look like typical web clients um, as far as their TLS tags are concerned. On top of this, these toolkits will forward the HTTP user agent of the victim. So if the victim is say using Firefox, um, that user agent will be sent to the online service, but the TLS fingerprint will not match the, that of you know, typically what Firefox um, would, would, would have. So we used uh, what's called JA3 TLS fingerprinting to identify unique TLS implementations. Uh, and simply what this does is just concatenates um, uh, a fields from the TLS client hello packet um, and creates a hash to create a fingerprint. So we purchased 13,000 advertising impressions from an online advertising service and directed those, those impressions toward one of our servers where we recorded TLS fingerprints. And in total, we collected 163 TLS fingerprints from 400 or so uh, user agents. And we found importantly that these toolkits are, the TLS fingerprints of these toolkits are unique in this data set. So there aren't real users, um, at least in this data set, that have a, the same fingerprint as these toolkits, meaning that an online service can use this as a red flag if they see an authentication request coming from uh, a, a fingerprint like this. So very quickly, because I'm running out of time, uh, some countermeasures. So first, from, from a user's perspective, you as somebody who's browsing the internet, as is the case for any phishing uh, attack, but especially in this case, analyzing the primary domain of any suspicious URL is uh, highly important. Um, everything else is gonna look identical to the real service, except for that primary domain. That's where you will discover that you're being phished. Also utilizing uh, universal two-factor uh, authentication methods uh, will help secure accounts by preventing credentials from being used on these phishing websites. Uh, when we're talking about online services and anti-phishing entities, as I mentioned, you, looking for discrepancies in the client TLS fingerprints can help stop phishing attacks. And from the perspective of an anti-phishing bot, utilizing these network level detection techniques can help when searching for phishing websites. So in conclusion, man in the middle phishing websites, uh, man in the middle phishing toolkits rather, allow attackers to launch highly effective phishing attacks. However, the unique architecture that these toolkits use to create these effective phishing attacks allow us to fingerprint them at the network layer. In total, we found over 1,200 of these toolkits in the wild targeting real users. And at the moment, Anti the anti-phishing ecosystem does not effectively capture these toolkits. All the code for FOCA and the data sets that we created are located at this URL if you're interested. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. And we'll be happy to take any questions. We do have a couple of questions um, for the both of you. The first question is, in a network time analysis, can reverse proxy in between not cheat to already trigger first SIN request to avoid the visible gap between T2. I think they were referencing back to when you guys were going over the SIN analysis package. You want to understand? So you're saying if, if, if they add a, another they reverse proxy can cheat with the timings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the toolkit could cheat the timings? Yeah. So uh, if I understand your, your question correctly, you're saying you can, you know, Delay, say that the the TCP handshake to make it look the ratio look look more realistic. I'm assuming. Um, 
sure, you can assume that, that that's something that maybe one of these toolkits could try to do. But then when you when that's another discrepancy that we could actually use eventually, you know, if we know that these toolkits are doing something like that, we can see, you know, an IP address that's located right next to that IP address of that toolkit is responding with a TCP, uh, a TCP handshake in half the time or a third of the time. Uh, to that IP address. So there's these delays are artificial. So that's another artifact. Um, the second question is what could prevent uh, these MITM phishing sites not detected by anti phishing scanners? So the um, we, we do address this a little bit on the paper if someone is interested in, in reading the full details, but effectively, um, I would say the vast, vast majority of existing anti-phishing scanners were con are content-based, right? So they will effectively flag a website when the content of that website matches a phishing target. In this case, effectively, because these tools are so powerful and have these built-in uh, evasion capabilities, uh, unless you have the exact uh, URL that includes the token that the uh, attacker is using, uh, the phishing server will just redirect you to a benign website. So the phishing scanner may see the domain somewhere, but will actually never be exposed to the content unless somehow it gets the full URL, including that special token. Uh, what we're doing fo in FOCA that's different than prior work is that we're actually fingerprinting the server as opposed to trying to fingerprint the, the content. So the, the server can try to redirect us to YouTube to Google, but uh, we will still be able to say that this is an evil GeneX server. Uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, this is just something benign. Okay, and our last question, uh, does it work with X-Frame options and CSP sets? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I addressed this at the beginning, um, but that was a you know, while ago at this point. Uh, so what happens with when these toolkits get a response from a web server, if there's say X-Frame options or CSP or any other sort of, of uh, you know client side defenses like that, they're simply just removed. Uh, there's regular expressions within these toolkits that will just look for that type of a header and just you know, remove it. So it's like it was never there. So that's why you can't rely on anything within the content itself because the attacker has full control over everything. Great. Well, thank you to the both of you and thank you to everyone who is attending this session. Um, I'm seeing comments that this was very insightful and informational and Great. was very much enjoyed. So thank you to both of you. And um, we will be starting the next session here in the next few minutes. So right, I appreciate all of your time. Bye.